So as you probably already know, Six Flags is in complete and utter disarray. Rides are malfunctioning, park presents are leaving in a mass exodus, and the parks are an absolute ghost town. So how did we get here? At the end of 2021, Six Flags assigned a brand new CEO, that being Salim Basul, who at the time was serving on Six Flags board of directors, meaning that his buddies, the ones that he had been serving on the board with, decided to put one of their own in charge. This happens despite the fact that the company had a solid balance back year in 2021 following the pandemic, and that they already had just recently assigned a brand new CEO at the end of 2019, being Mike Spanos, who only ever got to run the company during the pandemic, meaning he never really got a real good shot to run the company. So why make such a rash and harsh decision to change the CEO position at a time like this? Well, it's probably because Salim had an idea. He had a strategy to potentially take Six Flags to a point where not only they can more directly compete with their competitors, but also surpass them and enter into a completely new league within the theme park industry. So what was Salim's grand strategy? Well, he wanted to raise prices and by nature would end up ultimately lowering attendance, which would make guests happier because there'd be less lines and less crowds, but the guests would also be spending more because prices would be increased. And as a result of the lower attendance, you wouldn't need to hire as many employees to run the park, thus saving on cost. It's a strategy that Salim believed would position Six Flags into being a premium theme park experience, when before they had really been the bargain bin, cheap theme park experience for most guests. Instead, Salim believed Six Flags could be much more. But if you watched the last video, you know it didn't quite end up turning out that way. In quarter two of this year, the first quarter that they implemented this strategy, they missed expectations on earnings by 50%. Simply put, that is atrociously bad. Worse, Salim didn't back down. He said, no, this is the right strategy. I believe in it. We're not doing anything to change it. And things are gonna get better, guaranteed. Well, Six Flags just reported their third quarter earnings. And if you don't know, this is the most important quarter of the year for these regional theme park players like Six Flags and Cedar Fair because this includes July, August, and September. And as a result, because it has majority of the summer months in it, it has typically the most revenue and net income included in it. So if Six Flags were to do really good here, it could theoretically make up for the really poor quarter two. So what do you say, Six Flags? Come on, you can do it. What you say. Oh, somehow they are worse. How could they be worse? If you remember in the second quarter, Revenue was only down by 5% and this quarter was down by 21. How? How? On top of this, attendance was down by a third, a whole third. They lost 4 million visitors year over year. And that's versus 2021. Forget about comparing that to 2019. 2019, they had 14 million third quarter visitors. Oh my God, a massive drop off. The two good things about these financials, if you want to call them good, or the fact that net income wasn't down as much as Q2, woohoo! And also, total spending per guest was up, which is of course a part of Slim's strategy, but so was lowering attendance, which as you can see, was lowered way too much to the point where they're no longer making as much money as they were, even just last year. But you would think, you know, okay, well, people expected this, right? I'm obviously not gonna make any major changes from Q2 to Q3 that would drastically improve things. So of course, the stock market analysts knew this was happening. I mean, they obviously reeled back their expectations after seeing the terrible Q2 earnings report. And yes, they did reel them back, but evidently not enough as Six Flags still missed on earnings by a sizable margin. So after a terrible quarter and missing estimates, surely the stock price plummeted again, just like it did last quarter. Wait, what? Shares of Six Flags riding higher despite missing estimates in the latest quarter as activist investor H Partners increases its stake in the amusement park operator. There you're taking a look at shares. Oh yeah, they are flying higher, nitro style, by about 18.9%. Oh, okay, did you catch that? The reason why the stock went up astronomical is not because people are actually optimistic about this company at all in the future. It's because this one activist group, Age Partners, which already had about 15% of all Six Flags shares, decided to increase their holdings up to 20%. You could just look at this and be like, well, maybe they actually do have some confidence in the company going forward, or they could just be dollar cost averaging because obviously the stock is down quite a lot. They might just be like, you know what, let's buy it at this lower price. That way, you know, we can cash out a little bit earlier now and actually make some decent money. 
Or who knows? This could be the start of a hostile takeover. Who knows? Twenty percent of the company. I mean, yeah, they could make a they could make a move. Every single line, though, in their most recent earnings report, down. Total revenue down twenty one percent. Net income down twenty six percent. They were also charging higher prices too. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, all of this at a time where we had seen Disney's results come out just the other day. What happened there? Yeah, parks, experience, products, good, up thirty six percent. Now, yes, you're right. Six Flags earnings report was awful. It was terrible. However, you can't really compare them to Disney. Disney's in a league of their own. You know, they're the market leader. They could theoretically be doing fantastic while the whole industry is struggling. So it makes more sense to compare Six Flags to the direct competitor, which in this case is Cedar Fair. Like Six Flags, Cedar Fair operates a number of regional theme parks and tends to focus more on roller coasters and rides as opposed to themed experiences. So let's ask the ultimate question, Cedar Fair or Six Flags? Now to get a grander kind of scope of this all, let's go ahead and compare the first nine months of this year instead of just the third quarter. The final three months of this year may have some impact on these numbers, but at the end of the day, when you see <laughs> the gap here, it's not gonna make a huge difference. Not to mention that Six Flags canceled Holiday in the Park at five of their parks this year. So if anything, quarter four probably would have been worse for them, but I digress. Also keep in mind, Six Flags has four more theme parks than Cedar Fair does. That's going to be very important when looking at these numbers. So revenue for the first nine months this year, Cedar Fair beats them by almost 400 million. Attendance beats them by 5 million. Spending per cap, this is the one thing that Six Flags has beaten Cedar Fair at. And that is that they are getting their guests to spend more. But when you look at this in comparison to the attendance numbers, you kind of realize, well, wait one second. These numbers are kind of similar to spending per cap. And yet, Six Flags is not pulling anywhere near as many guests at Cedar Fair. Why is that? Well, it's very simple, folks. Cedar Fair has proven to their guests that they are worth that price tag, right? Six Flags has raised their prices to a level similar to Cedar Fair, and in some markets has even raised it higher than Cedar Fair. And guess what? Guests have not shown up. Why? Because Six Flags does not offer the same value as Cedar Fair. Their parks are nicer to be in, they have better atmosphere, they're cleaner, and they're just generally ran better. When a Cedar Fair Park gets something new, it's always something major. It's always something that moves the needle, right? Whether it's a major new roller coaster or it's a brand new themed land, they're always getting something major. They don't just add something to add something, right? Six Flags Parks, especially in the past, are notorious for just adding flat rides year after year when they don't need them and when they don't do anything to convince anybody to actually show up to the park or to even improve the park experience. Well, let's dig a little deeper here. So obviously Cedar Fair is providing a better experience, however, that surely must cost them a lot of money to do so. So let's see about the net income side. Does Six Flags stand a chance? Not even close. They'd be in by 200 million. Yikes. You break that down on a per park basis, the store gets even worse. Six Flags gets beat by $20 million per park. Their average park is only bringing in $6.4 million this year. That is absolutely atrocious. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that Six Flags put the cart before the horse here. They raised their prices up to Cedar Fair's level and people said, no, 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 we're not willing to pay that price again to your part, but we're willing to pay that price again to Cedar Fair. So what Six Flags really needs to do is they need to make meaningful investments in their parks that actually improve the atmosphere, improve the quality of the food, improve the efficiency of the parks, make them look nicer, make them nicer to be in, while also bringing quality roller coasters and attractions to the parks. That way you can eventually get your parks to be on the same level as Cedar Fair. And in that point, you raise the price. Instead, Six Flags raised the price, assuming that they were already on the same level as Cedar Fair, when clearly the consumer does not agree with that sentiment. So after getting slapped in the mouth for back-to-back -back quarters, including the most important quarter of the year, what does CEO Selim Basul have to say? Is he gonna be as adamant about his plan going forward as he was in the second quarter where he was saying there's no shot in a bucket of stack we're changing or has he maybe learned a lesson here has he maybe said you know what maybe we went a little too hard in the paint and perhaps we need to reel things back let's take a listen to the earnings call with Celine basul and see what he has to say what lesson have we learned through this transformation this year we weren't afraid to be bold with the changes that we made to our business model. Some of these changes were well received and effective, others were not. The transformation of Six Flags will take time and our results will not be linear. The result in the third quarter 
reflect this, a quarter in which we also were faced with inclement weather, record inflation, and sky-high gas prices that negatively affected attendance. Not gonna lie, they has the first half. Salim is clearly admitting, well, yeah, things didn't go right, we made some mistakes, and we learned some stuff, but then he immediately follows it up with excuses that no other company in the theme park industry right now is saying is a problem at all, right? I mean, Cedar Fair is breaking records out here, and Disney, Universal, SeaWorld, they're all having fantastic quarters as well. So to bring this up and say, oh yeah, but that's why intense was low, it's nothing but excuses. When really, you need to own up to the fact that your strategy led to that low attendance. But regardless, you said you learned some lessons. Okay, did those lessons actually amount in a new strategy? Salim says they did. I would now like to discuss how we are applying the lessons we have learned over the last year to our new strategy. Our team is applying these lessons in four main areas. First, making further investments to the park's infrastructure, new rides and the guest experience, including marketing and technology initiatives to reach new consumers that are likely to enjoy the theme park experience. Second, fine-tuning our product architecture and pricing. Third, establishing a strong autonomous culture with an emphasis on cost discipline. And finally, amplifying our seasonal events. These initiatives will never be complete as we seek to continuously improve but you are beginning to see green shoots that this is the right path forward. Now, I know that sounded like a grand new strategy from Salim, but basically has the exact same strategy he already had going into this year with two notable changes. One, he said, new rides. Woohoo! Yay! New rides. Of course, you remember last quarter, he said, why would we need to build rides? We already have enough ride capacity. Get out of here. <laughs> As if that isn't the whole reason why anybody visits Six Flags is because of the rides. So you need new rides. Of course, apparently he's been convinced. Now, why is he being convinced? I actually don't know. Because yes, these two quarters have been awful, but there have been new rides that have been opened up this year thanks to the previous administration. So new rides really wasn't the issue for this year. It was more so the issue going forward. So it's a little bit weird that he's like, oh, wait, yeah, no, no, no. We do need new rides now. When that wasn't the reason why this quarter and this past quarter were so bad. On top of this, he also mentioned that they're going to continue to play around with pricing. And I mean, I hope that that means they're going to lower them because clearly people do not want to visit the parks at this price. Until you actually improve the parks in a significant manner, which is going to take a lot of money to do so, majority of people are not going to be willing to spend Cedar Fair money to get into a Six Flies park. But going back to the new rides thing, that's kind of the one thing in this earnings call that everyone got really excited about. It's the fact that Slim out of nowhere said, you know what, actually we are going to start building new rides. And that's great and all, but as we know, because of how late he's come to this conclusion, 2023 will not have any new rides in it, except for maybe Aquaman, hopefully. And he even mentioned this in the report saying that, yeah, 2023 is not going to have anything, but in the future, we're going to have some new record-breaking roller coasters. Woohoo! With an announcement even this spring about new rides coming in the future. Wow, that's exciting. But there are a few concerns with this. I mean, for one, 2023 is looking pretty dire. I mean, yes, you're talking about playing around with pricing, which might get some more people to come back to the parks. But I can tell you, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this video, Slim hasn't changed pricing in a super significant way. So though 2023 will probably be an improvement over 2022, it will still be a piss poor year. With that being the case, is it a smart idea to announce your new rides for 2024 at the very beginning of the 2023 season? Probably not. That's probably pretty stupid. You're basically telling your guests, hey, don't come this year because next year you'll actually have something new to go visit. It's kind of the reason why like a park like Universal, for instance, will clearly and obviously be building a new attraction, but won't say anything about a release date or even announce it until only a couple months in advance because they don't want people delaying their trips until that ride comes out. So in doing this, you're kind of screwing over 2023 before it even got started, and it's already in a really bad spot going into that year. On top of this, with 2022 being way lower on the income side than they're used to, and 2023 presumably being in the same boat, how much money is Six Flags really going to have to play with as far as investing in new attractions for 2024 and beyond? Now, as stated in this call, apparently they have about $130 million 
budgeted out for capital expenditures, which would include new rides and attractions, and with this being increased in 2023 and 2024. However, considering the lower than usual income that they're going to be seeing this year and next year, and the amount of debt that they're straddled with from COVID, surely there's going to have to be some cuts made. And indeed, they did announce that. Of course, that $130 million that was spent this year on capital expenditures was all spent on beautification and events. There were no new rides built that weren't already paid for. So in 2024 and beyond, forget about new events coming out. Forget about the parks being improved in any meaningful way, right? The atmosphere of the parks are going to stay pretty bad. And I mean, listen, you might be saying, well, weren't you complaining about the fact they weren't building any new rides? Isn't this a good thing that they're shifting this whole budget towards rides and attractions? Yes and no. Obviously, it's very important that they get rides because that's what brings people into the parks, right? I mean, that's this, that's the main selling point for any theme park is, hey, look at these rides we have. However, if you want to convince anybody to come back or to spread good word of mouth about how great your park was, it comes down to more of the rides. It comes down to the experience. It comes down to the atmosphere. It comes down to how clean your park was, how nice the employees were, how quickly they got their lines. If the experience of going to your park was not simple, fun, and easy, people are not going to come back and they're not going to spread good word of mouth, regardless of how great your rides are. So for me, the two really work in tandem. Rides bring people in and beautification gets them to come back. So ideally, you want to be spending money on both. But the fact that they won't be spending any money on rides in 2023, I guess it's not the end of the world if 2024 they spend solely on rides and then hopefully they go back to doing a mix of the two. Makes sense, right? Well, evidently, Slim doesn't agree with me because he actually thinks that beautification can be a selling point. He mentioned how they didn't spend money on marketing this year and blames that, blames that as a reason for why people didn't come to the parks or didn't like the price that they saw because he claims that they didn't communicate the value. Bro, you don't have the value. You can't go ahead and be posting on social media and running a social media ad that says, hey, look, we got a new flower bed. Come to Six Flags. That is not a selling point. I'm sorry, it's not. So again, stop with the excuses, man. Just take ownership. But this wasn't the only delusional statement that Salim said during the call. He also then said, our social media reach is second only to Disney, which from a follower basis, because you have accounts for all of your parks individually, might be true, but... I can tell you, in execution, it's certainly not. And then he brags about pushing the decision making of many things onto the parks themselves because they know how to do it better than anybody else, which sounds great in practice, but when you consider that either he fired or had a bunch of park presidents leave and hasn't replaced them yet, who are you even putting these decisions on? Who's actually making these decisions? I don't know. But that then brings us to the most important part of this call, and that is with the pricing. As I've said time and time again, clearly, Audiences are not willing to spend this kind of money to go to Six Flags. They're just not. So something needs to change. Either the value needs to improve, which let's be real, it's going to take a long time to do, or the price needs to come down. So let's see what Slim's strategy is. Well, before we even get to that, apparently they're saying that October, which was not in this earnings report, by the way, that's in the next one, was so incredible when it came to annual pass sales that they went from having 44% of active pass holders compared to 2019 to having 89%. That is a massive jump and isn't really that far off from where they were in 2019 considering all the price increases they've had. That sounds amazing, right? One thing they don't really mention here though is the fact that, well, <clears throat> kind of had a bit of a deep discount going on in October, a bit of a sale, which more than likely attributed to this increase in annual pass sales. And as you can see, the lowest annual pass price has been brought down during the sale to 65 bucks a pop, which at Six Flags Great America, which is for what this is, was very similar to what you could get a season pass for during 2018 and 2019, even before that. I mean, this is a great price tag. And so it means Salim actually listened. He actually did learn his lesson. He lowered the prices. Fantastic. However, <laughs> not so fast. Salim went ahead and removed a ton of the benefits. For 60 bucks for an annual pass, you used to be able to get perks such as bring a friend free days, access to the water parks, as well as access to all Six Flags parks, to name a few. Now, either those perks are completely gone, like bring a friend free days, or they've been locked behind much more expensive passes, like the being able to visit every Six Flags park, which is now behind the most expensive pass. So yes, under this new season pass tier system, which... By the way, this is the third one they've had this year. 
Salim has lowered the price down to a comparable level to 2018-2019 with the sale, but has gotten rid of a lot of the perks and benefits that used to come at this tier. However, it seems that because of this increase in annual pass sales, I mean, it seems that maybe this worked. However, keep in mind that towards the end of 2021, around September, there was a massive sale on season passes for about 40 bucks a pop, right? That lasted all the way to the end of this year. So I wonder what that number versus 2019 is actually going to look like once those annual passes expire. That should be interesting to see. So with Salim adjusting his strategy based on the piss poor performance in quarter two and quarter three of this year, it seems that maybe there actually is some hope for the future. It does seem like the short term is still going to be pretty bleak, but maybe in the long term things could be salvaged. Right, Salim? Now, where do we stand on the timing of reaching the 25 to 25, 7 million guests per year? I think we always say that it's a three-year process. We feel that within the next three years, we'll reach that uh, target. Oh, so you need to the end of 2025, aka four years after you started to actually get to your ultimate goal. Yeah, you should know as being somebody who's on the board that there's no shot in a bucket of stack, you are getting that time. Spanos, who didn't even get a chance to run the company, got two years. Two years. Two years that were shot. Two years that he tried to make the most out of and actually was able to salvage the last one. Instead, you take a year that every other theme park is excelling at a crazy level, breaking records, taking advantage of the post-COVID interest in the parks. And yet you have the gall to say that sometimes when you implement a new strategy, you have to take a step back before going forward. And though that is true, in this case, it was absolutely not true. This should have been a fantastic year for Six Flags because of the massive demand in theme parks. Instead, you basically just said, no, don't come to Six Flags. Go to our competitors because they actually have more reasonable prices for the value they're providing. And instead, you shot yourself in the foot because you were so concerned about the fact that your price was not the same as Cedar Fair and SeaWorld. And now where does that put you? Now you put yourself behind by several years compared to the competitors just because you had to raise the prices before actually improving your parks. Now listen, Salim, since you're actually starting to learn your lesson, I actually would love to see you continue to be the CEO because it seems like you're actually taking the parks in a positive direction. Slowly, but you're getting there. So I don't really want to see Six Flags start over again with a CEO who has no idea what they're doing. But let's be honest, Salim, you delivered one of the most disappointing years Six Flags has had since they went bankrupt. Spanos did not do that, and he was let go in two years. I'm just saying. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Do you think that Salim has taken the company in the right direction? Do you think there's a chance for him to salvage it? Or has he really just screwed the pooch? Is it over for Six Flags? Is it nothing but downhill from here? Is Cedar Fair and SeaWorld just going to gobble up the pieces and do what they want with it? Let me know in the comments. Love to hear what you have to say. And I'll see you all next time. If there is a next time, peace.